Hello and welcome to Game and Read. My name is Peter. And I'm Aaron. And for the last part of this pairing, we are joined by our special guest for the Meddling Tentacles, Jordan Sprunger. Say hello one last time, Jordan. Hello one last time. Jordan. <laughs> Jordan. So this is our final episode of the pairing where we're going to dive in with what we thought of this game and this book put together. As a reminder, the game is... Day of the Tentacle by Lucas Arts, Tim Schaefer, co-directed. Uh, and then our book is Meddling Kids by Edgar Cantero. I want to start this discussion with the tone of these stories because okay. I think I think that that is such a uh, key topic I think that the story and the use of humor and some like the well not some all the referential aspects of meddling kids and day of the tentacle mm-hmm. really are a, a lot of them <laughs> a lot of just like the essence of both of these these medias so Starting with humor, what did what do y'all think about how the way both of them used humor to tell the story and move it along? I would say Day of the Tentacle used humor a bit more effectively and that I thought it was funnier. <laughs> I didn't especially <laughs> love... I mean, I know we've done plenty of ripping on uh, meddling kids. I generally didn't love the humor of meddling kids. It came off as kind of like faux sarcastic that way that like people like to write but nobody actually talks that way and where it's just like people are just kind of barbing each other constantly and i wasn't a huge fan of that i did think there were some like kind of vaguely funny moment i think i thought there were some funny moments i don't want to say vaguely i thought there were some funny moments but i think it came more in when they weren't pointing it out too much so it wasn't the referential humor but more like the Oh, we're being attacked by monsters, yada yada yada. Like there were there were some humorous bits in the action, I thought, that may have just been funny to me. I don't know if they were meant to be funny, but it was kind of like this is a ridiculous scenario. Oh no, another bad thing happened. This is kind of funny. Cause you kind of assume I guess you don't necessarily assume that they're all gonna make it out, but I had a feeling that the main characters were gonna be okay. Um, because he already killed off one of them before the book even began, so I was like, okay, these three and the dog will probably all make it out. Otherwise, this is taking a much darker turn than I'm anticipating it being. So I think there was some humor there, but I think the actual dialogue humor and jokes were more apparent in Day of the Tentacle. As someone who liked meddling kids, I I don't know. It doesn't leap out to me as like a funny book. Or is like, so, whereas, like, Day of the Tentacle was definitely, like, designed to be humorous, right? So, I don't know. I I mean, there are some funny parts of meddling kids, but I don't know if I ever, like, felt like that was any way his intention. <laughs> I felt like that was maybe just... I don't know what this happened and more and like, I don't know how to put it. Uh, it just never seemed like a focus of him to try and be funny. It what I felt. And I guess where I saw the humor in meddling kids is in set. Is it's like barbs it like, you know, the sharp, the sharp humor uh, and a little bit to what Peter is saying with the sort of ridiculousness of some of the situations. Uh, but I also think it's, it's, to me, some of the humor in Meddling Kids was unintentional, but related to those referential kind of aspects. So we can sort of talk a little bit about that. Uh, Day of the Tentacle is obviously funny. Like, there are so many. See, to the it point. It is apparent it is funny. To the point that I got tired of the gags. Wow. I was like. This okay. is so funny. I hate it. <laughs> I sort of. There were <laughs> there were a few times that I was like, okay, we get it. Like, Hoagie is a slob. Ha, ha, ha. This is, or he says dude a lot. This is so great. We've only seen this line 700 times. Or, like, the whole, 
the whole Laverne is crazy. Like, oh, haha, Laverne wants to dissect animal things. Yes, we know. So it's whereas I just I think that they neither of them did an amazing job with humor. Again, maybe Cantero wasn't intending it to be meddling kids to be funny. I think he meant there to be some jokes. Definitely the the conversational bits. I thought he was like, oh, what a what a fun repartee I'm having between these characters. <laughs> I if he was like, no, that's a dead serious conversation, <laughs> I would be surprised. He's definitely pulling for like, a, oh, this is kind of funny. They're insulting each other, just like friends do all the time. Wait, friends insult each other all the time? I guess so. <laughs> I definitely occasionally poke fun at my friends, but it's not like the entirety of a conversation. Yeah, I just think that neither... For two things that that felt like there should be funny, I... D- like Day of the Tentacle was too much and meddling kids was like both too much and not enough. Like I, I think I agree about some of the points that I thought were funny. I don't know if they were supposed to be funny. Sort of like when you laugh at a part of the movie and you're the only one who laughs and you're like, oops, I guess but that wasn't a funny best part. Moments where you're just like, this is hilarious. And they probably didn't fully mean for it to be hilarious. And that's why I think meddling kids, I do see the humor in meddling kids. Cause there are those moments that I found enjoyable. I found, I found humorous, maybe not but like I think straight he was up, trying to be right. Right. So, like, not straight up joke, though. Like, those moments were not as funny, but just like this humorousness sort of, uh, it's so insane that these things are happening and that this is the way that this this case, this reunion is unfolding to sort of the uh, the pure, just over the top, elaborate shenanigans is what definitely kind of got me that humor. And it's a dark humor, I think. I think the part that I found funny, if I if I need to cite a specific example, that I don't know if it was intentionally funny, because it's not really dialogue-based, is when they're in the house, they're in the, the haunted mansion on the island, and suddenly Nate is just like bolting. He's climbing out a window, just like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I just found that to be really funny because up until that point, he hadn't really come across as like cowardly, which is one of like Shaggy's core traits and Nate being kind of the Shaggy guy. He's got to be cowardly at some point. And so when he suddenly is just like, I'm, I'm fucking leaving. I'm not saying anything. I'm just going. And they're like yelling <laughs> after him. I'm like, okay, that's pretty funny because they're like, oh, when's he going to do the thing? And he finally like ran away. And they don't, I don't recall them making a ton of jokes at it. So I think it was supposed to be a bit more of a dramatic turn, but I just thought it was kind of humorous because they were like, and Nate's climbing down the window. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah, that's a big jump. All right. So that, that I think that's one of those moments where I was like, that was a funny situation to me. And I think we're depicted in, a more visual medium like you know Scooby Doo was being a cartoon that would have been a funny laugh line in action. I think one of the one of these sort of pitfalls of meddling kids is that it is so referential to Scooby Doo and to to Lovecraft that you know so there's really referential that some of those things I do think would work so much better visually. That is one aspect of Day of the Tentacle that is done really well. Um, the kind of pivoting into the referential aspects of these things. Day of the Tentacle obviously is by Lucas Arts, which is George Lucas, which is Star Wars, right? So they're, they're related. <laughs> they're related. Yeah. They're they're in the same family. Uh, so they're. And I noticed some of them, and I looked up a couple more, but there are a ton of Star Wars references in Day of the Tentacle mm-hmm. that are funny because you see them, but you like it wouldn't be funny if it was just like text and they were describing a room and you know there's a Darth Vader calendar on the wall. Like it's not. I think meddling kids suffers from some of that. Like this gag. Mm-hmm. It's, I guess it's not a gag. I don't know. Nate running out the window. Mm-hmm. I visually see that as Scooby Doo, right? Like you, there are yeah. those moments in the cartoons, in the movies that you see it and it's funny, but it doesn't have the same impact when reading in text, when reading in text. Um, but one of the Star Wars references that I thought was hilarious is that to get the diamond, 
you call 1-800-STAR-WARS. Why <laughs> is that the number for the diamond? Doesn't matter. But it's just like, oh, yeah, don't forget. We but we did Star Wars. Unless Peter's looking at me like perhaps there was diamond connections to Star Wars. <laughs> no, it's just it's funny because, you know, I'd be like, oh, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a, a 1-800-STAR Wars. And they go, hold on, let me count all those. Like, oh, that's too many. So I, at the same time, it's like it's it's kind of a gag, but also like, hey, they don't need to put in a five 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 number because they just made up a phone number that doesn't exist because it's too many letters. But I I think it is it is interesting that they put in kind of all those Star Wars references because while anybody who knows corporate ownership BS would be like, oh yeah, George Lucas, Lucas Arts slash slash Lucasfilm Games. They also own are related to Star Wars because George Lucas, but the brand isn't Star Wars. the The Lucas Arts logo isn't the Star Wars logo. It's you know kind of this little like guy, and it's it it's not inherently Star Warsy. So the fact that they're just kind of being like, oh yeah, we're the, also the Star Wars company, so we're gonna throw those in because we like Star Wars and we can, and nobody's gonna sue us because we're the also the only company that makes Star Wars games right now. Um, I think it works pretty well it's just like a fun little you know design element Mm -hmm. i don't think there was anything indiana jones related though i don't remember and maybe i didn't catch it but the biggest things i noticed in day of the tentacle um and were the star wars aspects and then obviously the references to the original maniac mansion game which i did you can play in in the day of the tentacle um, and it's also sort of a weird sequel spinoff. It but is technically a direct sequel because it's the same, or Bernard is one of the characters in the original Maniac Mansion. He says, I have to go back to the mansion. Right. It's still the Edison family. They just are all a little different than they were in the last game. So it's a direct sequel where they changed a lot of stuff along the way. Speaking of sort of the sequel aspect, uh, you know, meddling kids, is sort of a sequel of its own stuff. (laughs) I mean, it's this idea of this group of the group of friends getting back together uh, many years later. But the reason I bring that up is do you, do y'all think that so in day of the tentacle, this sort of direct sequel, it's fun. If you know it, it does it. It doesn't add really that much. No, I content didn't, wise. I didn't know Maniac Mansion existed until I was maybe twenty twenty two, okay. and I loved this game as a seven year old. Right. So it's not like pivotal, but in in meddling kids, that the early part of their lives is like the crux of them coming back together. So what? I mean, do do y'all think that they did? They gave enough of that backstory to make it feel like sort of, you know, what's going on and you, you can get that feeling or do you think it was just sort of thrown? Do you feel like it was sort of thrown in there a little bit like the way maniac mansion was where you kind of know it's in the, like you, it's sort of in the background. If you know what's like, I guess I'm just thinking like how the time differences. Do they set up the background of the meddling kids enough that if you don't know what Scooby-Doo is, you will still enjoy it? Exactly. Gotcha. Jordan, do you have an opinion on this one? I don't think so. I don't think you would. I don't think it would be possible. I feel like you have to know Scooby-Doo for meddling kids to work. But I say that as like an American reader. But he's also like... Catalan and like writing for like an English, like a, I know he's big in the UK. Mm-hmm. So is Scooby Doo big in the UK? Does anyone know? Oh, Ooh, I, I, <laughs> I don't know specifically. It is a fairly, I mean, it's still an ongoing cartoon. I'm sure there is some knowledge of it, if not any sort of popularity. You also have to take into the fact that, you know, there were those two live action movies that I'm sure were released internationally. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there is some decent knowledge of Scooby-Doo, even if it was never a big hit. I mean, it's, it's really whether or not it got aired there in 
you know, recent memory, like the 90s or 2000s. It looks like it aired in the UK when it aired in the in the US, so 1969, uh, and appears to be, based on my quick little Googling, um, broke the cartoon record, according to the BBC, in 2004. So it sounds like it it's- was it was sort of in the culture, in the cartoon sort of world of the UK and in England and uh, maybe not as much as it was here. I don't know, but certainly at really high levels. Like I imagine people would know what Scooby-Doo is. Well, and Scooby-Doo did have a hour long movie that was co-starring Sonny and Cher. Nuh-uh. Yeah, but they're not British. They're not. But I think they're big in the UK. Are they? Specifically, like big in the UK. I mean, I'm sure they're. I'm sure they are known, but I mean, Scooby Doo had a ton of guest stars, and I think it's just one of those media properties where it's, it is pretty well known, and that's why they keep making stuff because it has this knowledge base. People are still attached to it. You know, they they don't try and make like Flintstones stuff anymore because I don't think people care that much about the Flintstones anymore. Okay, but there's still an attachment to Scooby Doo, and with how the current like film world works and you know how they try and market things overseas it's got to have some cachet if not in europe possibly in asia because they wouldn't still be making like those they're they're making the new scoob movie and they wouldn't do that if they couldn't sell it to places other than just the united states that's fair what i think that this little (laughs) tangent we've gone on reveals is that at least it reveals to me y'all can correct me if you think differently okay uh Is that Cantero really pulls so heavily on the Scooby-Doo, the Enid Blyton books, which we had no idea what they were, but it sounds like they were really big in the UK. Um, He pulls really, really heavily from those. And you wouldn't, maybe the story wouldn't have the same kind of impact and maybe wouldn't capture your interest as much if you didn't, didn't have familiarity. Whereas Maniac Mansion to bring that, that comparison in Maniac Mansion isn't critical to day of the tentacle story. You can clearly as Peter, your experience has shown, you can love day of the tentacle and not realize that Maniac Mansion was a whole game ahead of time. And if you know that that's a fun little like, Ooh, I know that. I get that reference. I know what, like, I understand why he says back to the mansion, blah, blah, blah. But it's not changing your experience of Day of the Tentacle. Yeah. So the re- even though it is reference material, right? I mean, Bernard is directly taken <laughs> from Maniac Mansion. Uh, it's not, it's not a crutch, Whereas I think Scooby-Doo is being used as a crutch in Meddling Kids. Right. I think Meddling Kids is a book no one would read if they didn't like Scooby-Doo. Like, if if you <laughs> knew what Scooby-Doo was and you're like, that cartoon fucking sucks. I hated it. I never liked it. I watched, like, two episodes. Re- it was lame. Do you really think there are people in the world who hate Scooby-Doo? Probably. <laughs> like, it, it's it's a big enough thing that, yeah, there are people who hate it because there's people who hate anything. Um I wouldn't say, oh yeah, if you hate Scooby Doo but know what it is, go read. No, it's you gotta have like some affinity for this to actually want to read it. It's one of those things where it's like, it's it's a little bit like Ready Player One in that it's a kind of poppy fiction thing that really holds on the fact that it is going to be referencing thing that the reader either likes or knows about. So Ready Player One, if you had no idea what it, any of those things he was talking about, you might still enjoy it. I don't know, but it it really is kind of based on like the, you know what some of these arcade games are, you know what Rush is, you know what all the other crap he, you know, you know what Zork is, which... I don't know what Zork is. I know, but that, I mean, that it's it's okay. (laughs) (laughs) But it helps if you know what Zork is, and I knew what Zork was, so when I read it, I was like, haha, Zork, okay. Um, And so I think books like that and stories like that don't necessarily hold up to people who don't have those kind of attachments and knowledge base. And it's just kind of a, but I I think that's what he was going for. So I guess he achieved his goal. I doubt he was writing this being like, everyone's going to love this, whether or not they know what Scooby-Doo is. He's like, I'm writing this for people who liked Scooby-Doo and those fab five books. 
and want them to fight Cthulhu. Going off of that, I guess going away from that, do you want to talk about the the characters we have to compare and contrast who we're dealing with? Yeah. Kind of the, the main crews. So we have the, the, the Day of the Tentacle crew. We've got Bernard Bernoulli, the nerd. We've got Laverne, the kind of future mad scientist medical student girl, uh, woman, excuse me. Uh, and then we have Hoagie, the, the dude bro, roadie, who likes hair metal in 1990. And then on the meddling kid side, we have Nate, the sort of shaggy as checks himself in and out of mental hospitals. Uh, we've got Carrie, who's the smart one and the hot one. She is both smart and hot, the best of both worlds. <laughs> and then there's Andy, who is the strong sort of tomboy, tomboy leader, because Peter is a ghost. He was like golden boy Fred, but he's dead. And there's Tim, the dog. And in, dog. and in Day of the Tentacle, there's Nameless Hamster. The Nameless Hamster of Day of the Tentacle. The the official fourth member of the group. Um, I don't see a ton of similarities between these two groups. Just in how they operate. Because Bernard, Laverne, and Hoagie, I don't think they're friends. I think they're just roommates. Like, they don't seem to really interact with each other much. I mean, partially because they're split up for pretty much the whole game. But they don't really seem to be, like, chums. I think they all just, like, found a cheap lease together and are like, okay, we can tolerate this. We can all share a TV, right? And I think that's kind of the relationship I get from them. I've never read them as, like, close friends or anything like that. Uh, where it's entirely the opposite in Meddling Kids, where they were very close friends, now kind of distant adults trying to, you know, rekindle some of that and go through their past together. I don't know. What, what do you, what do you guys take on that? Did you read the day of the tentacle people differently? I think while the, <laughs> while, okay, the groups do structure differently, right? Like you've got, I did get the sort of roommates vibe. We're all students that go to the same school. Yeah. They're all kind of maybe? college adjacent. You got two people who right. are definitely studying things. And one guy who just like goes to stuff. parties and right. concerts. I don't think he, hoagies in any classes right. he's too busy rocking out so i definitely got the roommate vibe and then obviously meddling kids the whole hor- the whole story hinges on them having this really close relationship uh, as children and then coming back but i do think there are some interesting parallels between individual characters okay uh, i would argue for me the strongest one was between nate and laverne <laughs> okay <laughs> i think that you know, Nate is painted as sort of the unstable one. Part of that is his own doing that he sort of paints. Him, he thinks of himself as sort of unstable, uh, sort of nutty and, you know, sees, sees things. Uh, and Laverne is totally painted as the like, quote unquote, crazy one. For me. So I just like, without her even talking, <laughs> you can look at her and just visually she is represented. And Peter, you mentioned as like a mad scientist. And I think that that sort of is very apparent in this idea, like something is off kilter. I would argue that Laverne is super unstable. Like I, which to me, it was just interesting that the way that they painted her, you know, she is the one who gets put in the human jail and then like 
hits on the tentacle and then like j- wanders around. She always talks about dissecting things and, and tearing things like op- cutting things open. She <laughs> just is like an uh, opposite of Nate is like willing to just go do like jump into wild situations without thinking through it. But I think to me, the connection is that both of them are sort of the outliers of like, I felt Bernard and Hoagie had more of a friendship than either of those guys did with Laverne. Whereas I also felt like Andy and Carrie sort of had a maybe deeper relationship, more nuanced relationship. And Nate was sort of on the fringes. And so to me, those two characters kind of, I mean, they're odd parallels. So can we start shipping Hoagie and Bernard? <laughs> no. <laughs> like they're definitely boyfriends. I'm good with that. No. <laughs> uh, like they're, they're, they're opposites attract. You know, that's a two bedroom apartment they live in because Hoagie and Bernard are together. You know, he, he helps invent new like speakers for Hoagie to, you know, plug into his guitar and, you know, blast sound intensely. I'm just trying to think of things Hoagie. Bernard would do that would complement Hoagie and I'm not sure what Bernard gets out of this. I feel like it's kind of a one-sided relationship because Hoagie's in love with music, too. Well, when Bernard ends up... Hoagie and Bernard are really just Marty McFly and Dr. Emmett Brown, but they're the same age. Okay, and so Dr. Emmett... Well, oh, yeah, Marty McFly. Oh, okay, Hoagie is Marty McFly. Yes. Gotcha. And they're dating. Okay. <laughs> I'm with this. All All right. Right. If Rick I'm and Morty didn't some... exist, we would have a pretty good show concept right here. I'm going to go write some slash fiction. <laughs> I'll be right back. I mean, they got the time machine. It's pretty easy for them to get the same age in the same time frame. It's totally possible. Yeah. Y'all are absurd. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait till my slash fiction gets like... 14 readers. <laughs> I think Macklemore needs to release a new version of Same Love, but it's about time travel love. It's okay to be gay and a time traveler because it, it's love. That would have made the time traveler's wife so much better. Okay, that one we can rewrite. I feel like that is due for an update because it's been like <laughs> 11 years since that movie came out. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> Going back to the characters that these two groups. So I'm arguing Nate and Laverne are sort of parallels. I also. Laverne and Carrie do have a couple things in common with regards to dissection, which Carrie does several times and Laverne talks about regularly, as well as both of them being students of biology. That is true. I also think. Carrie is interesting because she has sort of these parallels with Laverne, but she also has some parallels with Bernard because Bernard is the, you know, the nerdy, smart, geeky one. And Carrie obviously has that aspect too, like the very Mm -hmm. sciencey, you know, smart thinking through things. So she, she sort of is split, which makes sense if she's both, the smart and the hot one, like neither Bernard nor Laverne, I would argue are like, and not Hoagie either. Hoagie's no one the is, hot one. No. Hoagie is the hot one of those three. <laughs> no one is the he hot is one. He's a thick boy and I respect him. <laughs> no one is the hot one, but, uh, but Carrie sort of brings, applies some aspects to both of Bernard and Laverne uh, in the intelligence aspect. Yeah, I would say uh, it's it's it. This is where we have to differentiate what type of like nerd some of these folks are, because Laverne is very much like a biology nerd in what she studies, whereas Bernard is really a a Radio Shack nerd. He's an old timey kind of Poindexter, where it's like, yeah, he likes radios and physics and much more like I I don't know like. High-minded mid-century science over, like, say, natural science, which is Laverne's specialty. Like, Bern- Bernard wouldn't become a a doctor. He would invent some weird machine is more kind of the, the, the trajectory he would be on. And so, yeah, Bernard and Carrie, I don't think, really match up because Carrie's base is all biology-based with then just 
historical knowledge, kind of. She's just kind of a all-around knowledgeable person. And Bernard never really comes off as somebody who's especially knowledgeable about anything but his fields, which don't really come into play in the adventure. Do we need all of the protagonists in each story? <laughs> like, do y'all think that we need... Well, we need three time periods, so well, we need three <laughs> protagonists in the tentacle. <laughs> but, like, I mean, truly, do you think that the the in these sort of main protagonist groups... Do you think everyone moves the story, respective stories along? Do we need everybody in Scooby Doo? Yes. Oh. Peter argues yes. Because I feel like in Meddling Kids, the only reason we have the characters that we do have is because of Scooby Doo. So the question is really do we need all of them in <laughs> Scooby Doo? I, because, I mean, Meddling Kids, I think at this point we've come to a consensus that it's just a really Lovecraftian Scooby-Doo pastiche. For sure. I... Can, can I argue for why I think we need all the characters of Scooby-Doo? Absolutely. All yes, right. please do. Okay, so what did Mystery Incorporated do? They traveled around finding mysteries very haphazardly, solving them, and we're not even sure if they made a reward. So I think this is just something they did for fun. It was a way of avoiding the draft, I'm sure. Um, but it was just something to do. Anyway, so who do we have? We have Fred. He's the leader. Yes. Okay. I'm pretty sure he's the one who owns the van. Why he's that preppy yet owns that <laughs> much of a hippie van, I'm not sure. But I think it's his van. And he's also the one who I think really gets his like kicks out of solving these things. Because I think he likes getting photographed in local newspapers. I think he's just like <laughs> collecting clippings and being like, look what a good boy I am. So he's really the driver of the scenario. Daphne, I think, is just like his main gal pal. I never really have read that they have... Really, I don't feel the sexual tension between them. Even in the Scooby-Doo Zombie Island where they're actively pretending they do, I don't think they're into each other. Anyway. I'm going to ignore that comment. So we don't have time them, for so he's like, yo, Daphne... <laughs> Um, come, come on, let's go find stuff. And they're like, okay, let's go solve some mysteries. Who do we know? Well, we know this Velma lady. She's pretty smart. She's pretty handy. I cheated off all of her tests in high school. I can't really survive in the world without her. We need her around to just like know stuff. She is our computer in a time before computers. Okay. I'm buying it so far. How do you get Shaggy and Scooby? So Shaggy and Scooby are not integral to Mystery Inc. They're integral oh, to the show. Okay. Because yeah. without Shaggy and Scooby, the show is a lot less funny. True. So they True. aren't necessarily important to driving the plot the same way on the, the show we are watching right now, Aaron Scrubs. The janitor's not important to any of the plots. He's just the janitor. He's there to make jokes, and his jokes generally make the show a lot better because they're like, ha, that's funny and has nothing to do with anything in the main part of the show and that's what they're there for they're also there to get scared they are the most frightened of all the characters so they do add something to the overall experience of watching the show but they are never helpful in actually catching the bad guys other than accidentally okay so i okay so you're arguing that they are all necessary see i turning to meddling kids would argue that tim is you don't need a dog. What does the dog do? The dog is to reference Scooby Doo. Right. That is what it's the for. The dog is Scooby. <laughs> Precisely. I don't think you need him. I think you throw him out. Goodbye. Bye bye. Uh, but he's secretly a Native American <laughs> chief. Exactly. That's especially like. Uh, so I guess uh, you need Nate because he sees Peter's ghost. Right. Does Peter need to be dead? I don't think so. No, I think that dead Peter, They, I think it could have been important that Peter's dead because if he was in a ghost realm and like he could, he could communicate with other ghosts and then tell Nate things that ghosts did, or if there's something like that, it would be far more interesting. But I think in the current iteration, Peter does not need to be dead. I don't see what he adds as a ghost. I would argue Peter out of there, Tim out of there and day of the Tim uncle, Edna, who apparently is Fred's wife. Yes. Out of there. You push her down the stairs. You basically throw her out of there anyway. She's there to be a sexual older woman. <laughs> Don't you silence her. 
<laughs> well, I don't know how to respond to that one. <laughs> exactly. You don't. I'm right. No, I think that Hoagie, as fun of a character as he might be, is... is but then who you, goes to colonial times? Literally anyone. What's wrong with Hoagie? Why not a why not a roadie? I, I I'm very pro Hoagie. Yeah, this is a pro <laughs> Hoagie right. podcast. <laughs> we stand a king, I and his name Hoagie. is Hoagie. <laughs> Hoagie is my god. Aaron's breaking down a little. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Aaron, I'm going to start talking like Hoge just because no. you love him so much. I will divorce you. <laughs> My point is, anyone could go to colonial times. What? Okay, Laverne, she, in the doctor's office, her biology stuff comes into play because she, like, recognizes anatomy shit, whatever. So, like, I could buy that connection. But what thing that's unique to Hoagie... Like, I want to play as Green. I want Green Tentacle. He's an improper man in a very proper time. Because what would be out of place in old colonial times? A 90s metal guy. Or a Green Tentacle. Yeah, but Tentacle's not a playable character. He's, you know, he's there. You're there to save Green Tentacle. He's the, he's the, he's the damsel in this one. <laughs> Is he? Kinda. You're trying to help him. You're like the you get the letter from Green Tentacle, and that's what makes you go to the mansion. Fair. Green Tentacle doesn't exist. There's no fair, MacGuffin. Fair. Okay, whatever. So basically, all the characters move the story along in both aspects. Is what I'm gathering from your two <laughs> arguments. Well, no, <laughs> and I I would say I like the Scooby Doo characters, the Metal and Kids characters. What I would do differently is I would keep Peter in the picture. Their Fred version, I think, was a weird choice to kill him off because they basically like half replace him with the local townie kid who doesn't really have a Scooby... I can't remember anybody who was ever a townie kid who was reoccurring in any of the Scooby-Doo, so I was kind of confused like who he was. Maybe he was a reference to the, one of the Fab Five characters. But I think some of the roles he played, like what if Peter slash Fred was like their leader and their friend, quote unquote, but it was basically just like a huge dick to them all the time. And then they have to deal with like the, oh man, you were such an asshole to us as a kid, actually. We were technically friends, but like we kind of hated your guts. I think that would have been a bit more interesting and had some more interpersonal drama to the overall group. Because what ends up happening is that the interpersonal drama you really wind up with is Andy loves Carrie, Carrie isn't sure she loves Andy, and Nate's over there in the corner. And I think having Peter actually be there and be more present would have been a bit more interesting. And I guess they killed him off partially as like, oh, you don't know if Nate's actually crazy or not. You don't know if Peter's actually going to end up being the villain or not. Because they kind of have that fake reveal at the end with his zombie walking around. But I think it would have been better had Peter been alive and they still could have built in some of those red herrings. Yeah, I think of the so of the things we've talked about, I think in Metal and Kids, um, the world building is probably one of the better parts of the book. Like it's one of the things I don't actively have any complaints or critiques of really. Um Agreed. I like I I felt that it was like it seemed if seemed real within the parameters of the book. Um, I liked sort of that it had a history, um, a silly history, but it was a history. Nonetheless, the De Bowen mansion seemed really cool. It seemed really detailed. Um, I could definitely see, uh, like that being in like a, like a, like a, a horror, like a, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, the DeBone Mansion was cool too. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, I think that meddling kids, I to me, the strongest aspect is that I felt like I knew what Blighton Hills and Sleepy Lake was like. I think that I could, I mean, I can visualize the lake. I can visualize, you know, they're on the lake and the fog is coming in and I can visualize the house and I think that Cantero does do a really great job of giving you 
enough detail in a way that doesn't just feel like overburdening or like you said, Jordan, it feels very realistic and grounded. And I could totally picture that. And I think that I could picture it while, and that helped me continue to get through the story because I could sort of see the setting where it's, where it's happening. And there are these sort of fantastical elements with the Cthulhu aspects and the ghosts and whatever. But I had sort of an anchored place in, in yeah. the story. Yeah. Tying that in with day, of the tentacle, both of these, while day, of the tentacle takes primarily just place in the mansion over three different time periods, the primary action of metal and kids is in the mansion and the, the mines and caverns underneath that are attached. And so I think setting up the, the classic creepy mansion as the kind of primary location is one of the nicer connections between the two. Um, Because on, on surface, what we wind up with is that these two things look a lot alike. We have a group of young adults going to a creepy mansion to solve a problem or a mystery that they are faced with and you know calamity ensues in different ways um and then it's only once you get into the 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 details that make them what they are that they really start to be like oh these are nothing alike as far as just how our pairing goes but they do have that in common and it is they're both very kind of maze-like environments. Uh, making your way and figuring out all the different hallways of the mansion is very important to being able to navigate the the game effectively. Uh, same as it was for just figuring out where all the things are hidden for the characters in Meddling Kids. And I, you know, there's just a little bit of significance of, oh, you just kind of got to like, you have to map out your location. That's one of the primary things the Meddling Kids are doing. And it's one of the primary things you're doing as the player across these three different time periods. And I think the mansion in both and both medias is such a, a good setting. I mean, it makes just so much sense to have this mansion be the primary location. And I think just like Cantero does a great job of, of giving you that sense of knowing of knowing Blighton Hills and Sleepy Lake and the Debeau and Mansion, and you really feel like you can, at least I feel like I can picture it. I think Day of the Tentacle does a great job of rendering that mansion across the three time periods and changing it. I mean, it changes drastically aesthetically, and and some aspects are different. Different pathways sort of open up depending on which time you're in. But overall, I mean, it's the same mansion. It's the same layout it's the same. The doors look different, but they lead to the same sorts of places. And I think that they do a really good job of balancing the familiarity. So you really do get to map yourself out in each of the time frames, with also giving you just a visually unique mansion for each time that you don't, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like, oh, I'm going through this again and it's the exact same even though I'm in future and not in present or whatever. The Just the visual touches made it feel, much like Meddling Kids, made it feel grounded sort of in this reality. These the realities, I guess, across the time machine. But the realities that we you were playing in as the player. Let's talk villains. We really didn't talk much about... I know we talked about villains of meddling kids in our previous discussion. We really didn't t- touch on Purple Tentacle and anything about him. And he's kind of a non-player in a large portion of the game. I was just about to say, I think the reason we haven't talked about Purple Tentacle is that he's so... Obviously, he's important because you don't have to save the world if he's not evil. But like... He doesn't do anything. Let me back up. Yeah. I think, so the whole concept, right, is that Edison is putting out sludge water. Purple Tentacle drinks sludge water and turns evil and then wants to take over the world. And so in the future, Purple Tentacle has succeeded and is a dictator and has taken over the world and humans are slaves and pets and stuff, right? But Purple Tentacle as a villain to me like yes you were trying to stop the world domination but really so much of the game is about you getting your friends back 
in the same time period right. that I honestly kind of forgot. Like, you don't really feel like Purple Tentacle is this this evil presence that you're trying to stop. He's not pulling any strings because he's also just 100% not in the past. And it makes sense why he's not in the past because, you know, he didn't come to time in, you know, the world in colonial times. I just think it would have really been fun had there been like a time traveling purple tentacle or tentacle in the old times uh, as well, because he's really only present in the future and then briefly in the present time. Comparing Purple Tentacle to to the villain, DeBowen, De Bowen, uh, you know, I think that in some respects they have that similarity of sort of these distant, distant forces of bad. They do have, they both do have, seem to have eternal lifespans. That is one thing they have in common. <laughs> uh, and, but really the, 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 defeating of the villains purple tentacle you roll him over like you 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 play bowling yeah. with purple tentacle because he makes a bunch of himself and then you you shrink him down right yeah and then you roll into and him then and you then you roll you beat into him. him and then you win because it's a cartoon once you knock somebody <laughs> down you win <laughs> whereas de bowen was just such a a more dramatic con- confrontation which of course i think that that fits the media, you know, that fits the stories and the tone going back to sort of the tone of these two things are very different. Uh, but purple tentacle, I feel like to a better villain, not a good villain, but I think there are a lot of issues more active, but a more active, more sort of pivotal villain than purple tentacle is, even though you know what the threat is from the very beginning. Right. Really day of the tentacle may not be the is a good name but may not be the most fitting name for this particular game since most of your action is solving time travel so i guess the name should have something more to do with time travel because that's the bulk of the game but then you're only doing that to try and stop the tentacle Eh, it's kind of splitting hairs it's just not necessarily the most descriptive of what you're actually doing in that game. Whereas Maniac Mansion, you go through a mansion full of maniacs. It's fitting. I will say I think that meddling kids is not, because it's so heavily referencing Scooby-Doo, it makes sense. Obviously, that's a part of the phrase from Mm Scooby-Doo. But I, much like... Day of the Tentacle was not really about a tentacle. I mean, it is, but it's not. I felt like meddling kids is Scooby-Doo, but is also not. Like, okay. I I felt like I was I was expecting it to be much more of a mystery, an active mystery. Mm. And to me, meddling kids was not so focused on on an active mystery. Like, I yes they are coming back together because they feel like something they missed something or, you know, the right person didn't get caught. And so there's a myth. There is a mystery element, but I think that by setting it up as Scooby Doo esque, I had very different expectations for what the mystery and adventure was going to be. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that sort of parallels to the day of the tentacle where day of the tentacle, I truly, I actually did think it was going to be a lot more about the tentacles and not as much, not, I mean, you really spend like four of your five hours or however long, nine or 10. I don't remember how long it takes to play it, but you spend so much of it, not directly with the tentacle or like acting against the tentacle that I just think the expectations didn't, the, it didn't meet what I, what my experience was and not that that was necessarily bad. It just made it, I guess I'm more critical. I think of both of them because I just had different ideas of what they were going to be. Final thoughts. Was this an okay pairing, a good pairing, a bad pairing? Where, where do you fall? I think this is as good of pairing as you could have done with the material. Like I think these two match up better than anything else would have. I think they are both unique in a way. I mean, like Peter, you said, 
when you just sort of take them at face value, like when you just start looking at sort of the summary of like, what are these things? I think on that, on a surface level, they are a good pairing group of young adults, mystery, you know, mi- crazy shenanigans happen. But as you actually think about it, I think they have so little in common. Um, but I also, to your point, Jordan, I don't know if there is a better, I'm sure there's something out there, but I don't know what that match is. So I feel like yeah, it's so, so we did a so, so pairing. Meh. Yeah, I'll stick with so, so for this one. I know we can't judge a pairing just based on whether or not we liked the things we did, but I, having mostly not enjoyed this book, I'm kind of like, no, bad pairing. Never. Uh-uh. <laughs> terrible. Um, yeah. yeah, And, and I, I think once you get past the initial thing, like I said, the theme connections really aren't there and the tone connections really aren't there. Uh, there's nothing that actually ends up being horrific in the world of day of the tentacle because you kind of solve everything and even the future where the tentacle reigns supreme outside of all humans being enslaved doesn't seem all that terrible clearly they fixed the environment because there's still trees and stuff so maybe purple tentacle had some good ideas i don't know no 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 (laughs) i wouldn't mind being in a human show oh no (laughs) wearing spaghetti and meatballs as hair i'm not a mummy i can just do my own hair (laughs) Yeah, I think that these, I, you know, you hit some, you miss some. I think this was a mess. I think this was a mess. Well, that wraps it up for our meddling tentacles pairing. Uh, thank you, Jordan, for going with us on this strange, weird, this short, experience. strange, trip. <laughs> short, strange journey. Uh, you can, uh, as always, find all of our episodes and posts, as well as our list of upcoming pairings at gameandread.wordpress.com. You can find me on Twitter. I am at Nerd in the World. I'm on Twitter at Bookish Textpat and on Instagram at A Tale of Two Shelves. And I'm Roaming No Man at Twitter. Now, Jordan, I do have a question. Is that just a reference to the, the Travelocity Roaming Gnome? So I talked about, I was in another podcast this week okay. with Luke Vorwald. Oh, were you on and Rule he Warriors? asked me the same question. <laughs> Yeah, well, it just popped in my head where it's like, I think this has occurred to me before, but I don't know if I've ever gotten an answer. So what what made you the roaming gnome man? So it was 2009. Wow, you were I an early adopter. Created, I created this Twitter, and my goal at 17 was to come up with a name that someone might eventually want and <laughs> offer me money for. I love that you were and trying to game the system <laughs> to get some money. <laughs> and I saw a commercial with William Shatner and the little gnome, and I'm like, that's it. I think this you... sounds so unlike you. I've never been like, oh, Jordan, that guy who tries to get rich quick schemes. <laughs> <laughs> this is before we knew Jordan. He lived a past the life. Dark times. <laughs> You know that thing is just called the roaming gnome. I I <laughs> know that now. <laughs> well, it, it's an interesting... Uh, I, honestly, I just always thought of it as gnome man before realizing the roaming gnome is, you know, the, the, the Travelocity <laughs> guy or whatever. I thought it was more of just a, a fantasy D&D kind of reference. No, I definitely Travelocity. Okay, well, if you ever like started a travel blog, you have a good name for it. It's true. You just got to start a travel blog now. <laughs> and have like a cone hat. Oh, we can make that happen. That's a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> Our intro music was written and performed by Avery Murchison. There is a link to his band camp in the description. 
We will be back next week with a topic episode, and then we'll start the next pairing after that. So you have some time. Like we said, the list is over at gameandread.wordpress if you want to join. And if you ever want me back, I will gladly ship more random couples. <laughs> okay, with Peter. Maybe maybe that'll be our, our. Oh, that could be our next topic episode. We'll just start shipping random characters and oh, seeing dear. what their, their lives would be like. Oh, I think dear. that's a good idea. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Oh, just wait till my slash fiction yes. debuts. <laughs> On gameandread.wordpress.com. Gonna, gonna hire some hentai artist to Did make some hobby. Did you just call it hentai? Hentai. Hentai. You sound like you're from the South. Hentai. Call it hentai. <laughs>